Um, Jim, I think you've, you've, you've bridged the gap, if you like, between the policy world and the science world. What, what's the experience of the United States? Very briefly. All right. <laughs> I know briefly, uh, impossible, but if two, you could... Two experiences. Uh, one in the um, U.S. federal agency. We d we've just come out, as all of you know, uh, what I would call the eight, eight dark years um, and um, in this country. And, I, uh, and I've said this to some of my colleagues. It's time for the U.S. federal agency um, leaders to come to Europe, talk to Nicole, see what's being done here, because we're way behind in the integrative thinking. Uh, what's the experience in the, um, uh, as far as um, science for policy? I can give you an experience in Arizona. What we're doing is we are framing little Manhattan projects, again, Schellenhuber, uh, grand challenges uh, like telling ourselves that we need to have a sustainable water supply in Arizona by the year 2030. We need to, otherwise we need to leave. Um, and when we do that, when we frame it that way, then the research community, and then we challenge our research community, that forces an integration to because there's a common solution orientation. And the, uh, so, so certainly if I'm a federal manager or a state manager of resources and a community were to come to me with saying they're gonna organize to solve that problem, I'd be funding them. Okay, thanks very much again, you wanted to. Yeah, you wanted to. Uh provocative yeah, discussion. I do, yes. You know, now you get it. Uh, <laughs> I'm also in consulting uh, as a member of the Kiel Institute. Three theses, they're all interconnected. First of all, there is not science and policy. It doesn't exist as a continuum from good science towards less good science. There's a continuum of good policy to less good policy. Second thesis, it's not science and policy. It's science, policy, and the society, or you can call it interest groups. And that is the triangle under which policy is made, not a discussion between scientists and, politi and, and policy makers. And thirdly, all the solutions are mainly about distribution. Saving the world is politically an issue about di uh, on, of distribution, not one of saving the world. So if you take these three together, together we should uh, get away from our naive view that if we do good science, all of a sudden societies and policy will adopt this good science and this is it. Now, this process is very complicated and we have to think about it much deeper. Does anybody, Roger, do you want to? Um. Yeah, there are a number of us in this room that are working. I see Huey Min uh, sitting over there. And there are a number of us who are trying to put together a, a book on this question of how do you narrow the gap between science and policy. And um, there's a lot to be said about that. But just one comment about that is we need to be careful about our language. We talk about bridging the gap, the superhighway that exists between the two, the pipeline between science and policy, none of those are in the least bit accurate about the relationship between science and policy. And we've been using the frame spider webs to talk about what that intervening space is like. But the important thing is, and it comes back to points that Kate has made now a couple of times, is that problems get defined in that space. They get redefined. Science comes up with something by the time the policymaker gets it, it's not recognizable from what came out of the scientific community. It has been reformulated, reproblematized. Um, you know, new actors have brought in and reinterpreted what the what the question is. And by the time the policymaker gets it, you have a whole different product than what came out of the sciences. And we need to understand those whole processes much better than we than we currently do. But it's not scientists and politicians who are the only critical actors in this, in this process. So who are the other critical actors? Because this will segue into the next session. In, very briefly, who do you think? So, well, I think it's industry. I think it's NGOs. It's policy, you know, what people call policy brokers. And there are a whole series of actors. And they come in and out of those systems. The systems are usually unstable. And, uh, and I think there are very different architectures to that space. There are very diffuse kinds of things. There are things that look more, the IPCC is an interesting case, and 
why it has worked well compared with other kinds of things, but it's atypical of, of what we have in most relationship between science and Again, and just, bef just before we move, why did the IPCC work so well? Why do others not work so well? Uh, it's, it's really points that were, from my point of view, it was points that was being made here, that one thing that we've discovered that works well is when science itself doesn't just define the problems, but actually the scientists and the politicians work together on things that the politicians need to know and ought to be able to do the things they want, and they get their blood in it in the process rather than having it handed to them and put up on the shelf. And I think the IPCC has done that really well. Okay, thanks very much. Carlo, you wanted to make a brief intervention? Well, there's a piece by Christian Azar in Climate Change where he compares the climate change problem with the abolition of slavery. There's a book he refers to. The book is called Bury the Chains. I think it's a very helpful book to realize how history unfolds in these things. Slavery has been abolished. It was a huge historical process. It goes with the Civil War in the US and what have you. There was not a single unified worldwide agreement, this nation reduces slavery by 5% and then by 7% and that nation by 12% <laughs> and then by 20% and all that stuff. It was much messier than that. And it was driven by many people and the kings and queens of England did play some role in it but rarely that of leading the process. And I think it's healthy to look at the climate change challenge in particular and more broadly speaking the sustainability challenge with this sort of experience in mind. Time is short, I won't give other examples, there are other examples. Somehow we must free our mind from this idea which Nicole mentioned as the platonic one which is behind the Manhattan Project. Here's the scientist, they find the truth, here's the king, scientists tell the truth, the king, and then the king settles the issue. That's just not how this works, but this does not mean that it cannot be done. Okay, Oram, I know you wanted to talk about this whole issue again. We're talking a lot about just scientists interacting with government and policymakers, but what about civil society, communities? What about the interaction between top-down policy and bottom-up processes? I know you don't like that way of framing it, but uh, I know that uh, there's a huge area of research there that you, I think you wanted to comment on briefly. Well, I'd just like to <clears throat> follow up briefly directly on what Carlo has just mm. said. Um, we talk about policy influencing what current decision makers are doing, but the whole big issue of large-scale social change. And large-scale social change often comes about when it does come about for reasons quite different from what the decision makers in the political capital are thinking about or deciding and doing. Um, but this in itself is a Clearly, social science doesn't have all the answers, but trying to understand the dynamics, the drivers, the uh, processes of large-scale social, social change is itself a major and important social science research issue. And if it is true that business as usual is not on, and they were looking whether it's 10 years or 40 years, we need to make major changes in society with respect to the climate change issue, if we are to make major changes to deal with the MDGs, the Millennium Development Goals, and as, as Nick Stern says, end poverty in this generation, uh, this is gonna require major social change. And so one suggestion would be, let's make a concerted effort as a community, whether it's funded or not by one government agency, let's make a concerted effort to try to improve the understanding that we have as to what causes large-scale social change. When does it occur, how does it occur, and what are the consequences? Okay, thank you very much. And I just want to cover one more topic before uh, we stop this show-and-tell approach and yeah, include all of you. Uh, the final area was how should uh, the research community organize itself better or differently to respond to these new challenges. I know we've touched on it, but I just want to revisit it briefly. And Kate, you were saying, I think, in the UK that you've managed to uh, uh, go down the path of interdisciplinary uh, research. Well, what, very briefly, what, how did you do that and what was the success behind it?